Um, first, I want to ask whether there are any questions about what we talked about yesterday. I already heard one question, so um, we can go over to this again. Uh, things that are clear or so, any questions remaining from yesterday? Uh, should I talk about this once more? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, there, there was a question about these, this file change semantics. And let's just go over that definition again. Um, I always think that if there's a question from one or two people, it's probably interesting to everyone. Uh, good point. I only have this one, but uh, okay. can you share with I have there are more, it's online too. Could you yeah. it's yes, nice. Yes, uh yeah. Yes, sir. I didn't have it. On page sixteen we were talking about the update rules for times um, file change semantics. Uh, is it page sixteen or seventeen? No, the first one. Oh, it is the old version. The old version. The old version. Sixteen. Well, the new version is seventeen. Sorry. Anyway, so there is a rule. We went through this yesterday. Tell me if, it's, if you don't want to do it, but I think that it's not a bad idea. There's a rule for updating these files, right? Um, where Remember, a file was a pair consisting of a set of active discourse reference called the domain and a satisfaction set. Let me just write that down so that the domain of this file is a set of discourse reference. Um, and the satisfaction set of this file is a set of assignment functions. Function, so this is actually uh, let me just write it down set of discourse reference. And the satisfaction is a set of functions. Uh, I'll just um, Set of functions in uh, you know, from from the domain of F to D, the set of individuals in the model, right? And so this is a subset of all the possible functions from this two individuals in the model. Right? Okay. So and then um, well, the first there was this kindness collision for updates. Updates are not defined if discourse referent uh, is used with, you know, uh, referred to with a definite description but not yet in the domain, or it's used with an indefinite expression but already in the domain. In that case, it's undefined. This is a novelty and familiarity um, condition on um, indefinite and definite non phrases. But if it is defined, then the um, rule gives us, it, it tells us exactly what the domain of the, the satisfaction set of the outputs will be. Um, and I think we are looking, so you have this in mind, right? This, yeah. this rule. Yeah. This one be. Uh, yes, OK, right. So we have a simple expression, say, this um, P, or it says it has R here, and let's just assume this uh, is a unary predicate. Okay. Now, uh, the notation of this is a function from files to files. So this is again a file which has its own domain and satisfaction set. Right? As I said yesterday, it's sort of our F prime. Right. And the rule tells us what its domain is, and also then later what the satisfaction set is. So the domain is very uh, simple. This is just the domain of the original file, plus um, x1. If it wasn't already in there, it is added to it. That's, that's all. And of course, if there are more variables, there are more references in here, then they're all added. To it. It's made sure that they are there. 
the satisfaction set of this new f prime is a set of functions and uh, they, are, they are referred to as a and b and so on in this and perhaps that's what's unsettling about it. So we say j, j, g and h, perhaps. Because we use those letters for variable assignments all the time. So this is one of these functions from the domain of the new z, and a new file, into the set of individuals. So that means um, the domain of this function, that is, things for which it is defined, right? things which it maps to individuals is the same as this, right? Uh, so, well, let me just explain. Okay, so you make sure that it's defined for all the active reference. And, now uh, this is perhaps the confusing part, there is a B uh, sorry, let me say h here, a function h, which is also an assignment, right? That's a subset of g, and this h was in the satisfaction set of f. And then there is the last condition that g assigns an individual to x1. Um, which actually has the property R. Okay. Well, the one confusing part of this is, I think, here, this, right? Um, and so let's just briefly remember that when you have a, um, a function, it's a set of, a set of pairs, right? A set of all the pairs of individuals. And I try to we try to recreate this um, example that we talked about. I hope I can remember the details of the uh, the cat. The woman is catching a cat. Example. Uh, well, perhaps it's a little hard to uh, do this. Oh, this blue round. Um, Well, so, okay, let me try. So if the original f uh, file is, as you pointed out last time, it's this, there's no information, no active discourse reference, and the set of assignments is empty, no assignment yet. Um, if you apply this denotation of this, to this initial file, um, then, well, so what happens? Um, of course, I'm, again, poor at managing my core space. The domain of this will be simply the empty set plus x1, right? So this is just x1. And the satisfaction set of this will be, oh well, something that satisfies these conditions, a function, g, well, a set of functions, all the functions g, which have this property that they are defined for x1. In fact, not only x1, but everything that was there before, right? The, the empty set as well as the set containing some, so well, only x1, okay, there's, uh, they, are, they are of this form, these functions, and there may be more than one, right? But they only have one um, referent in their domain. And so uh, a woman in, in this uh, example that I had, there were two women, A and B. So this is the satisfaction set. And yeah, the, um, now it's a little trivial because we had the empty set before, we should do this one more time so that actually something happens, right? But we can see that this is now also, well, fairly trivially satisfied, namely, um, there is an H, that's, there is a function that's a subset of these. So for each of these, there is a function that's a subset of it. 
and the member of the set, well, the empty set is a sub certainly a subset of all these. So perhaps what's confusing is that these are viewed as sets of all of pairs. So that x1 is actually really something like this. A, that's the first function, and the other one is this. That is just an alternative way of writing this, right? And so a subset of this is called the empty set. Uh, now, if we go and, and do this one more time and say, now uh, we also have a cat to say, right? A uh, woman, what's about a woman catching a cat? Um, then we um, want to update this thing here, right? Uh, this file. I, I'll just keep it like this and say, well, this is our file, right? Domain and satisfaction sets written on top of each other, doesn't matter. But uh, we apply now the denotation of x2 is a cat to this and ask what is the domain of that thing, right? And again, we go by the same rule. As x2 hasn't yet occurred, so we have to put it in. So the domain of this is the set of these two discourse reference and the satisfaction set of this output here is now a set of functions of this form. Um, each of the functions that we have there assigns something to both of these reference, right? Um, so they look like this. So well, there, there are, um, again, only, I think, well, there are no four possibilities because we have two women and two cats. So we don't need to spell that out. We have AC and AD, and then we also have BC and BD, right? Um, so that's our set of functions G. And once again, for each of these, there is something in here which is a subset of it. This is what ensures that all the values that were already assigned to the uh, previously used discourse reference are still preserved in here. And if x2 had already been in here, we would actually have gotten the very same satisfaction set as well. Because if there aren't, if there's no addition, we get this, this a, which, which has to be a subset of g, is g in, in that case, if nothing new is introduced. Yeah. So did that help? So uh, okay. And this is how, as I said yesterday, this is how the random assignment is built into this update procedure because we take all of these g's, and there is one for each woman. Right. So we have an assignment function for each woman in here. And I'll keep all these um, possibilities alive in the context. Any other questions about yesterday? Um, OK, so let's start talking about something else. There is a handout for today again. I hope you have uh, that one. As I said, yesterday I already you know, kept uh, putting in little previews of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, it will be about modalized versions of these dynamic systems. And like yesterday, uh, we will survey a few of these systems and for each of them try to get a grasp of how it works, basically you know, looking under the hood. And Picking in one little uh, problem or one little feature and look, looking in great detail at how that works. I hope it's a good method. So. The kinds of data that people talk about in connection with these, um, these modal dynamic semantic systems, among others, there are many applications, but uh, we will be talking about. So, first of all, um, the use of models, especially the word might has played a big role and there, I would say, is still no really satisfactory account of what might means. Um, but one little property that it does have is that 
Um, it is the first expression that we encounter which has this non-monotonic behavior in that a, a sentence with might that was once true may turn false in light of new evidence. Okay. That hasn't happened with the other things we did, right? All the updates that we talked about were just putting in new information. Nothing became false because of that. But here we have, it might be raining, and uh, this is, you can say that, and you can certainly follow up with, it's not raining. There has to be some time elapsing, right? Uh, you can't have these two beliefs simultaneously, but uh, one after the other. And once you have committed yourself to 1B, you cannot go back to 1C, with at least you know, not without some kind of revision of your assumptions. Once you believe 1B, you cannot just learn 1C, it might be raining by a simple update. Well, and of course, in 2, again, all the matters, uh, you cannot say first it's not raining and then it might be raining. Um, unless you have to you know, have a revision of your beliefs intervening. Okay, so this is just one little property. So this was, we'll, we'll go in some detail through that. Mortal subordination I already mentioned yesterday. Um, if John bought a book, he'll be home reading it by now. It'll be a murder mystery. So there are two problems with this. First, the it in 3b can co-refer with the book, even though normally we said conditionals don't do that, they close off their scope, right? The scope of these indefinites. Um, and the second problem is that 3b is interpreted as a conditional. Namely, if John bought a book, it'll be a murder mystery. Right? That's intuitively really what it means. In fact, perhaps it actually means if John bought the book and is home reading it by now, it'll be a murder mystery. It's a little hard to distinguish those intuitively, but you can imagine if you try to set up a formal account, you have to answer that question, right? Is it if A then, well, yeah, if antecedent then 3B, or if antecedent and consequent then 3B? Uh, we have a wolf, wolf might come in, it would eat you first, and so on. Um, now here too, uh, in 5, this is a, also a tricky example which shows that um, sometimes a lot of inference or sort of contextual processing is involved. My husband isn't home yet, B says, how would, do you know, and M says, the light would be turned on. Well when would it be turned on if the husband were home, right? So the, the negation of the negation serves as the antecedent of the consequent. Um, we said we talk about that yesterday too. And then at the end of today, if there is time, there may not be a lot of time to talk about conditional questions. Um, we'll see. Um, but they are also interesting because we have here mixed up plain declarative sentences as constituents of a conditional right, with questions. Uh, if Alfonso is coming to the party, will Joanna come as well? Um, it's interesting that we have these forms because uh, you know you wonder if a question is embedded and how what does it mean and how does its meaning combine with the rest of the structure and so on. Uh, plain run-of-the-mill theory of theories of questions are built for sort of matrix questions, right? Speech acts. What is this? Is this a traditional speech act or is this speech act asking about the truth of the conditional? What is it? How do we analyze these? Uh, they, well, we are probably, I mean, for one thing, there isn't a whole lot of the, on the handouts on the technicalities of this paper. Um, and we probably won't have time, but I'll be happy to say as much about this paper that I have in mind here as we can. Okay, first thing though we will talk about um, is this classic, um, which brings together these uh, 
you know, modal notions and reference to individuals in one formal system um, called co-reference and modality. And okay, now they first I, I don't know. So I think nobody has read that paper except a fair assumption to make. So I'll say a bit more about it then. Yeah. Uh, so they uh, go back to that point which we have also already talked about yesterday, namely that you always accumulate these two kinds of information in a discourse. You keep track of the facts, you learn things about the world, right? which is modeled um, as the el elimination of possible worlds from your um, life options. And the other thing you keep track of is discourse information, right? And those two interact in certain ways. We already saw that in these higher systems and so on. And we are knowing now um, going back to something that is very much like this first paper that we looked at yesterday um, by Heim on presupposition projection. But this is actually working better here. Um, um, okay, so in, it's, it's like that in the sense that we again have pairs of worlds and assignments and so on. Yeah, so, okay, let's see what this actually exactly works and um, how they combine modality and indefinite non-phrases. What we saw yesterday about this Heim paper is if you remember, we had these um, one, two, three, and so on, these assignments to you know, discourse reference to individuals, it goes to A, 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 and A, B, A, and A, B, and, B, and so on. goes on forever, there are as many as there are natural numbers, but for each of the assignments, there's also a word parameter, right? So all of these go with W and then we have a copy of the very same block of assignments again which goes with some other world and uh, you multiply this out it becomes a vast set of things we talked about that okay. and the one problem that we had with this system was that um, using just uh, free variables to represent indefinite non-phrases didn't actually give you quite the right truth conditions, for example, for negations of existentials. Remember that? Uh, so a sentence like, uh, no man is happy, doesn't actually reduce this set to all those worlds in which no man is happy. It reduces it to those worlds in which the discourse referent that you use in this sentence is not a happy man. But it doesn't ensure that there is no other happy man in the, in the same world. Uh, we, we, we talked about that yesterday and saw, saw that um, the way to overcome this, which has also later been done, of course, Heim and her official file change matrix also doesn't have that problem. The way to overcome this is uh, to make sure that when you in, Introduce or you know, when you use a discourse reference for the first time, make sure that it is just this random assignment to all possibilities. And this is built in here, a variant of something like this. It's not very different from this, but there's an important difference. So now they talk about referent systems here, and they are they look like very complicated things. And they are well, they are a little complicated. Uh, can't deny that, but uh, let's try to make it simple and see um, how exactly it works, what the intention is. Um, for now, just uh, let me drop all these things here and focus on what's going on up here. There is another layer of formal stuff up here. So you have these sorts of things which I am treated as discourse reference. Uh, in this paper, they are called pegs. A peg is something that you hang stuff on, right? So, okay, they are placeholders for something. 
They don't really have names or anything, and they are not referred to directly, but they keep track of information. And then there is another set of variables, uh, or say a, a, a tier of variables up here, which you know, we, let's call them variables. Uh, things like x and y and so on. Um, we might prefer to call those things actually the discourse reference, but I don't want to um, go be too pedantic about that terminology. So they aren't really there yet. They grow. This is a set which grows just as we saw in the other um, systems, where we start out with no variables up here, and then you introduce some. Now this. So this thing, a mapping from some set of variables, so this may be something like x and y, okay? Suppose there are two. A mapping from these to the natural numbers, that's what they call a reference system. A function from here to here is a referent system written R in this paper. And on page three, you see how um, the update of a reference system with certain reassignments is supposed to work. So um, you see here uh, on the top of the page, we have the 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, right? Uh, all the natural numbers. Doesn't matter how many there are, I mean, the, you know, there, are, there are enough, arbitrarily many. And then you have these little things that look like reassignments, and that's what they are. Uh, this, well, introductions actually, not reassignments, um, not necessarily reassignments, but assignments. So if you take some input reference system, you get an output reference system in which x is assigned to r. Uh, to, to, sorry, to 0. They start with 0. I think Hank started with 1, but that's just a technicality. So, uh, you know, if x was not yet active, it's introduced in this process, and if it was already active, it is shifted to a new number. So you see at the top of this page, uh, when, the, when the x is first introduced, it's assigned to zero, and then you may introduce a y and assign that to one, and then you assign x to 2, which means that x simply shifts over to 2, basically. And then you shift it to 3, and so on. So you move these discourse reference to different numbers as needed. Or you introduce them if, if they aren't yet present. Okay. The system is set up so that each time you do this, you use the smallest number that hasn't been used yet, so you, you climb up this set of natural numbers as far as you have to go. You use an initial subset of the natural numbers. Um, okay, let's uh, look at these definitions a little bit. Um, in 2, this Roman 2, the way this is actually defined, uh, set x to n, where n is some number, right? Okay. Now remember these two things, r and r prime, are functions from some set of reference to numbers. First thing that's required again is that x is now in the domain of that function. If it wasn't there yet, it is put in. Okay. Second one, now the range of a function like that, that is um, for our R, for instance, suppose we have this case here. Um, the, the highest number that we are using is 3. Uh, and that is, it means that we have range 4. Now, this is, I mean, this, we have this plus 1 isn't so important this, to make it work, but the point is that this range of R prime keeps track of how many numbers we have used, and it has to be one more than that of r. It has to be one more, even if x was already there, because x, this x is definitely shifted to some other number. n has to be a fresh number. 
in this uh, system. Okay. Even if x was here, we cannot. We need to. We need to go to some higher thing for. That's how this ensured by the way these actually are employed, these assignment operations. Well, and then x is actually assigned to that new number, 4 in this case, right? So this is, for example, something we can do. And the last clause says that uh, nothing else changes. They still assign the same things to all the other discourse reference, other, other than x. Okay, so we have this sort of register here, right? And the nice thing about this is that we can recycle variables. We only just need a small set, a finite set of them. But we can refer to inf infinitely, arbitrarily many individuals because we can always recycle one of our variables that was used before. And uh, even if we do so, the information that was obtained using that variable is not lost. It's not like in this uh, other system that we talked about yesterday where once you use the existential quantifier with, you know, there is an x, everything that was known about x is lost. Right? That's not the case. Uh, it, in a certain sense it's still there because this hook or this peg keeps track. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, this will never be used again. Right. And whatever is asserted about this, uh, you know, the individuals that various assignments assign to this number, that remains. And so they're part of the paper, they are not linguists, but they make a sort of weak, weakly linguistic point, namely that, well, it's sort of obvious that English, too, has only a very small number of pronouns, right, which we can use to refer to arbitrarily many things, even in one discourse. And, you know, sometimes it's easy with just M4 things, and sometimes we have to re revive these, um, these older pegs by referring to them as something like the former or something of that kind. Right? Uh, so there is a case to be made that these reference stay around even though our variables are reassigned, and uh, sorry, our pronouns are reassigned, and so uh, this is a nice way of keeping track of those things. Right. Is that pretty? Yeah. Um, it's maybe a technical question. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, the pegs are going to be doing the important work of keeping track of information about. Yeah. Uh, those, those are discourse references. Those are really the same thing. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, I guess I, I'm wondering why you'd want to have. Could you do this without variables at all? I mean, could you? Would it be equivalent to say that there's some linguistic expressions that <coughs> kind of have a kind of turn this into a sort of context-dependent way of assigning meanings to linguistic objects? Like, so, so presumably they're still going to say that the meaning of a pronoun is a variable, and then for the variable you do this stuff, right? Yeah. So the question is whether you could skip that variable step. Is it crucial that you've got this variable level in there, or could you define a mapping or a meaning or for pronouns or whatever? Oh, the pronoun that takes yes. you directly to the pegs. Yes, that's a good point. Yes, so that's actually yeah, that's right. I mean, they. What are the variables doing for us? Yeah. Uh, in the paper, yeah, this is a good point. Um, they talk in terms of a formal language, yeah. language of first order logic, which yeah. has variables, but um, that's not a necessary intermediate step. If you were to use English, then these would be the pronouns. Okay. Yes, that's a good point. So you would actually, in English, you would have things like it and he, and the next time you use it with some fresh referent. Uh, so, you, and you have to know somehow, there's still some magic involved, right? Because you have to know whether you use the variable with its previous assignment or with its um, fresh assignment. Yeah. But the point is, yes, so they say you can do with finitely for a small, a small number of variables. And the good thing they claim is that it's 
that in English also has just a small number of pronouns, so for them these two things are pretty much the same thing. But you know, we talk in terms of formal languages just as an analogy. Okay, now there are some formal notions coming up, all of which I'm sorry to say are necessary. We have to go through some definitions before we see how exactly this works. Okay. So the first is here uh, the notion of an extension, which is uh, very simple. Um, this R prime is an extension of R if, well, the, the all the variables that were in R are also in R prime in the domain. Sorry, the yeah, um, yeah, variables are also in R prime. Um, R prime uses numbers that are at least uh, Know, reach at least as high as those from R. So if you think about that, it's not an extension of something else. If your R, for example, is something like this, you have 0, 1, 2, 3, and you have, uh, say, x pointing to 3 and y pointing to 1, and then you have some R5, which has 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on, x pointing to 0 and y to 1, then this R prime is not an extension of R. Uh, even if you have a, another variable that's also an extension of R, because it's a separate condition that the highest number that you use in R prime has to be at least as great as this number here. Okay, um, and so all the numbers. Uh, sorry, the variables are either still mapped to the same peg in R prime, or they are mapped to high numbers. That's what this condition says. Okay? So if something is reassigned, it's reassigned to something high, higher number, fresh number, it wasn't yet used in R. So this is this what ensures, or well, it states what, is, what it means to actually introduce these new things. Yeah, these fresh variables that were not yet there, that are newly introduced, also have to be assigned to high numbers at the right edge of this frontier. If all of this is satisfied, then you have uh, an extension of your original variable assignment. Okay. So this uh, is intuitively really clear. Um, it will play a role later on. Now, now we can define our possibilities. So they are, in one sense, the same as Heim's world assignment pairs, because we have the same uh, structure down here, where you have W and then all these individuals, right, and all these numbers are associated with some individual, and that goes on for some time for W, all the possible combinations but then there is this world V, where it you know, goes on, on for some time with V, and so on. Because all these possibilities. As before, um, that was the high setup. But we also have this reference system as a third parameter of our possibilities. So they are triples. Uh, R, G, W. Where R is a reference system, up here is this mapping, G is this other mapping down here, and W is the world parameter. So we should not think of this line here as one possibility, because this very same line occurs in many possibilities with different reference systems. Right? This line W and this particular line of individuals occurs with all possible reference systems in our set of possibilities. So it's yet one other source of vastness, where it is just completely untractable as computer scientists are just uh, drop dead at the side of this. And, uh, and, uh, okay, but uh, that, is, that is how it works. And now the um, the introduction of a, of a new, this, um, sorry, okay. activation of a new variable 
um, is modeled in the following way. We see this on page four. Okay. Um, when, when you introduce a new referent into your referent system, the, well, obviously the domain of R changes. R now assigns values to two things and not just one. Say. But also the domain of G grows. Um, so we actually have something like this, these um, uh, we have um, starting out with something like a sequence on the 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and so on. So all the pegs are always there. But as long as you don't have any discourse reference or any variables in use, this and the world is all there is. Well, we, don't, we don't have to talk about the world right now. Um, now if you introduce a new um, variable and assign that to some individual, then uh, you know, Again, according to the picture that I had before, you have this one, two, three, four, and so on. X is now mapped to zero by this reference system. R of X is zero. And now G is activated as well, as it were. So it assigns zero to A, B, and C, and whatever how many individuals there are. Um, this is what basically what falls out of what you see at the very top of page four. G is a function from the range of R to individuals. The range of R is the set of numbers that are currently being used. Right? All the numbers from zero, not to infinity, but to whatever has been recently activated, the highest number in use. So if we then go on and introduce some other variable, uh, and there is assigning y to one, well you can see this for yourself. Suppose though uh, perhaps we assign now x to one, that is not what's on the handout. If we assign x to one, we also get a change, namely that now x sits here, it's assigned to one. And we have our G, A, B, C, A, B, C, B, 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 A, B, C, 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 whatever. You see how this works? So um, the range of this is now 1. It's the highest number, right? Um, and G, the um, the g is, uh, in our possibilities, is a function from that range to individuals. So as this grows, as we go and uh, use more pegs, g, the assignment of pegs to individuals, grows along. Okay. Those are different g's, right? Yeah, they're, they're, well, they're, they're actually partial functions. In, in, in the process of this building, there are partial functions from these Domains to um, so from these natural numbers to individuals. Uh, we'll see that in the formal definitions they come a little later on page five. So we'll get there. But that's what happens anyway. Is that okay? Um, Okay, so yeah, this is R, G, W are the possibilities. Um, and so, yeah, well, in the, later here on page four, you see some notational conventions. Um, for any possibility I, you can just write for convenience I of X. Uh, if our i is something like r, g, w, then uh, 
this is R of X and well, um, and for individuals, um, they have um, A or J. So this is whatever W assigned to J and so on. So we have this uniform notation possibility I of something and whatever is in here is assigned by the right component of this thing, right? variables or constants. That's just for simplicity. Okay, now um, in, in number 10 at the bottom of page 4 you see sort of the real thing, but uh, there's still only one world involved. Uh, for for simplicity, right? Because it's hard to, you would have to write everything as many times as there are worlds. Um, what is important though here is that something like the update with the fact that X is a man, that it uh, reduces potentially the number of assignments from pegs to individuals. So I'm not sure if I'm talking about a particular model here. All right, so suppose you have the sum world W that's written on top of these boxes. Sum world W, and the set of men in W is just a singleton set containing E. Okay. And so if you start out with this uh, possibility at the left, and number 10, where you have world W, this reference system assign, you know, having x and y active and pointing to 0 and 1. And accordingly, these assignments uh, giving all possible values to 0 and 1. Right? Um, if you update that now with the claim, the, the assertion that x is a man, you rule out all those assignments in which x is not pointing to b, because we are in w. Now, if we are in a different world, then something else happens as a response to x is a man. So which assignments are eliminated, of course, depends on the world parameter. But then if you, if you then reassign x to number, uh, yeah, you always go to one, uh, the, the one number lower than was written there, this, this minus one business. If you then assign this to 2 here, well, then uh, you again have all the possibilities. But the fact that 0 is assigned to B will never change. Right. Even though X is reassigned with fresh um, individuals. Okay, and an information state is just a set of those possibilities. And it's the information states, of course, that we are interested in. Uh, so this again can be thought of as the common ground or perhaps the belief state of someone participating in a some sort of information exchange, right? Communication. Someone's belief state combining both of these kinds of knowledge, world knowledge and discourse knowledge. And now here in number two on page five you see how exactly the reassignment is defined. Um, it's, a little, it's a little confusing because we have seen this relation now more than once. Something like this, right? Um, first as operational reference systems and then now uh, it shows up again as the relation between possibilities. So, start out with some possibility, which is one of these complicated things, right, these boxes we saw. Um, and performing this operation takes you to a new set, um, Um, 
because uh, it is actually not the same thing. I apologize. We are not talking about this function here, right? This was about sending something to the to a number. Here we are talking about a particular individual D. I'm sorry about that. It's, it's actually not the very same thing. So this is an individual in the domain. This is the operation of setting x to some individual. And that gives you only one new possibility, namely one in which the reference system is changed by setting x to the range of r, the old one. Range of r here is the highest number that was being used, or the number of things that were being used. This is simply shifting x to the rightmost thing, sounding a fresh peg. Okay? So this is some number n. This is what we saw before. So shifting x to the refreshing, you know, resending it. And g is also changed now from uh, in such a way that this number n, it's a little tricky because range normally we think of as something else, but in this paper, range of r is a number. It's not a set. Sorry about that. It's how it's defined. Yeah. Range of R is a number. Is this the, the, this the rightmost number that is of use? So G maps that number to the individual D. And the world, well, is of course the same that, that we had before. So all of this is under the assumption that I actually say that here, that, that uh, should, should have been stated somewhere that I starts out as this, right? Okay, yeah. Why do they want to have variables go to individuals at all? So, I mean... Yeah, we'll see that. It's an interesting question. It's actually... That's, we, that's what we'll step through in some detail because you get interesting problems if you don't do this. Yeah. Yeah, you might wonder, right, it's, it's interesting, but why would you not just randomly assign things to everyone? Uh, you get, you always go through a peg, that's what I was thinking. Right? Yeah, well, you get the wrong truth conditions. Huh. If you have a model in the scope of an existential quantifier. So, uh, let me see that it's coming up on the next page or somewhere. But not yet. Now we have uh, you know, the notion of an extension of this possibility. We don't need to step through this, uh, all of this in such great detail, perhaps. What matters is uh, you have the very same things defined for states. Now, these are sort of uh, you know, uh, overloaded, as it were, these, these operations here. They don't only work on possibilities, but also on states, which are sets of possibilities. So, uh, doing this operation on some set of possibilities simply gives you all the updated ones. So it doesn't point twice on everything in the state. And several notions are defined in this way simultaneously possibilities and states. Um, in extension, for example, a state S prime is an extension of the state S. If every possibility in S prime is an extension of some possibility in X, does it make sense? Can I just say this and done? Yeah. Um, the only thing that we still uh, need is this notion of descendant and subsistence, but that too is actually fairly straightforward. If you have two states S and this prime, and they are both uh, sets of some possibilities, i, j, k, and so on. Um, if S prime is an extension of S, that means in S prime, perhaps you have activated one of these new reference, right? All, all the possibilities are extensions of some possibility in S. So you have activated something new or some information, right? And now, saying this, 
every possibility here comes from some possibility over there via perhaps some operation like this means that every possibility here is a descendant of one over here, a descendant. Okay. Uh, and so the subsistence, I subsists in I. This should be in S prime, I think, and for in B, not before. I subsists in S prime, and in I prime, sorry. If I has at least one descendant there, S subsists in S prime if all possibilities in S subsist in S prime. Okay, now let's not go much further just digging through this de these definitions. But they uh, are needed to work up to the update rules on the next page, on page 6. See now how a state, an information state, is updated with information. That's um, what we were working up towards. Uh, it, is very simple. it looks very simple, but we have to talk a little bit about the possibility operator, at least. Um, and, of course, the existential quantifier. But first, uh, the first three clauses, they should be very familiar. We've seen this over and over, right? So, um, updating S with a, an atomic clause like P of T1 through Tn, where there should be a right closing parenthesis, uh, it simply gives you a subset of the possibilities in S. So most of these updates actually don't change the possibility. They don't do anything like this, introducing new reference or anything like that. They are simply eliminations of possibilities from S. So, uh, it's, uh, we saw this yesterday too, where um, most, most kinds of updates just consist in eliminating stuff. Right? Um, for negation, you see, this is also what we know. Uh, you keep all the possibilities I, which don't subsist in the state resulting from the update with phi. Now this cannot be stated in this case as I are, is not a member of this state because if phi has an existential quantifier then no possibility is a member of that state because they all look a little different, they have descendants. Right. Um, so means basically I doesn't, uh, doesn't have offspring, doesn't survive uh, the update with this phi. Those are the ones you keep. Conjunction is again just a composition of these two functions. Now, okay, let's look at the existential quantifier and the modal uh, might. Modal might. The existential quantifier now actually relies on this very operation that we saw, this one here for states, right, of introducing this x with a particular individual in mind. This is like a specific use of x, right? Um, x pointing to this individual. And that's what you do in the course of evaluating or updating with an existentially quite uh, quantified formula. Um, so, update with this theorem x phi. <coughs> Uh, what you do first is in, uh, introduce the x. Okay, you, you build this state. Um, for some d, pick some arbitrary d in your domain of individuals. Some individual, whatever a, b, c, something like that. And introduce x with this particular individual as its referent. Then update the result with phi. And so we end up asserting, uh, basically, we end up here, we end up with a state in which it is known that